Hi, welcome to An Atheist Asks. I'm Christy Winters, and today I'm going to be asking the psychology of atheism seriously. Before I start on the video, um, I just want to explain my hair <laughs> because it's Halloween today, and I have organized my day in such a way that um, I'm doing the video while my hair is being prepared for later on uh, when I do my costume tonight, so I've just gone all 1950s housewife on you. Um, so uh, I hope that's it's not too distracting, but um, my hair is going to look awesome later on. So just quick explanation as to why my hair looks like this today. Now let's get on with looking at psychologist Paul Witz and his ideas about why strong atheist men become atheists, or at least one of the unconscious pressures as to why these kinds of men become atheists. What I'm going to be doing is first giving you an overview of the video. I'm then going to present um, Dr. Witz's research and then I'm going to rip it apart because it's shit. And <laughs> there's really just no other way to say it. Um, so the, I'm really taking one, I feel, uh, for team atheism here because I saw the video initially when I was doing my research. For those of you who follow my channel, you'll know, you'll know that I'm doing research into deconversion and why in particular, North American Christians go in, um, find themselves becoming atheists or end up becoming atheists. And so I do a lot of research trying to find more information about atheism. This I found online. And initially I was kind of excited because I thought it was going to be going somewhere, but the more I watched it, the more infuriated I became. And so I'm not going to actually, normally in these an atheist ask videos, I go ahead and I put in the other video segments, you know, and, and I cut it up. I, I can't with this piece of research. It's too painful. It's too agonizing. And so I will, what I'll do is I'll put links to the, um, to the videos. There's, there's four videos in the series in the description box below. You can go ahead and watch it at your leisure. I will warn you in advance, don't have anything that you want to throw or you could throw at your computer screen and break it while you're watching this 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 video and that's just going to be my warning so instead of interspersing the video i'm going to summarize his points kind of like i do in my um, a different atheist reads series and then i'll, I'll give a, a response the piece of research that i'm going to be examining is a piece of freudian research and i want to declare up front i don't i'm not attacking freud in this at all this is not an anti-freudian rant this is going to be a critique of research design. And I'm a social scientist, so I'm looking at it from that perspective. I think Freud has a lot of interesting ideas, and people can have, you know, their preferences or dislikes about his ideas, but they were obviously very profound and transformed the way we think about our own psychology. So I, I don't actually have any, like I said, problems with Freud. Um, and if you're gonna, if you're a big fan of Freud or a big uh, sort of anti-Freudian person, you're not going to get um, I, on one side of the debate or the other from me, we're going to be looking at the research design and his research question, his research answer, why we should believe him in terms of the evidence he presents, and why we should care about his results. So let's see, let me just check my notes. Yeah, I think that's about it. Basically, if um, if you subscribe to my channel, this is the kind of stuff you're going to be, you, you subscribe for, and I did have to sit through hours of watching this video again and again to break it down. So this is why you subscribe and this is uh, the kind of content I put out. I take the one, I take the hits for the team so that you don't have to watch this crap. Um, so there you go. And if you enjoy this kind of stuff and you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe and you can get more of my breaking down really, really bad social research right here on my channel. Very quickly, I come from a social science background. I taught qualitative and quantitative research methods at the graduate level um, at universities around London, Brunel, um, Birkbeck College, and I did also some teaching for the law school at Birkbeck, and I did an undergraduate course in gender and politics at UCL, University of College London. So I know what I'm talking about when it comes to research design, and I want to um, present this in a particular way. So when I'm an academic or when I was teaching, I always had the value of presenting information in a neutral way, regardless of how I felt. And I'm going to kind of keep to that. Um, I'm going to present his stuff in a neutral way, um, and I'm going to try to present it charitably. And then instead of presenting my own views neutrally, I'm just going to have a rant. So you can look forward to that. But there are reasons why I want to present his research in a neutral manner, and I think it's important to communicate that to you, why I'm not mixing up my ranting with the presentation of his perspective. The first is, 
If I present my reactions to his research design as I present it, it stops you from having the opportunity to make the evaluations by yourself, to assess the research design and the agenda and make some conclusions. Your own instinctual, whether or not you find it credible, kind of gut reactions and thinking through the question. The other thing too is that if I start to insert my presentation, or my opinions and, and my views into his research design, then maybe you're going to be reacting to me or against me or for me rather than his research design. So I think it's always fair to present other people's positions as charitably as possible. That being said, it might be really hard for me to do that with this research because he does make statements that I find infuriating. Um, but I'm going to try my best. I'm going to try my best to be professional and be neutral. But again, since it's my YouTube channel, a little bit might seep through. Okay, so let's review what Dr. Witz does. So Paul, Dr. Paul Witz is a psychologist, and in the video links that I'm going to put in the description box, he is presenting what he thinks are his findings into the unconscious, perhaps, motivations as to why men become atheists, or some men become strong atheists, I think is, is a cl an accurate way of describing what he's doing. And basically, what he wants to know is, um, why, why are there atheists? And he's, apparently this is part of a series, but um, he wants to find out for two reasons. The first reason is that he considers himself a former atheist. He says he was an atheist for 20 years. And then um, and he was reflecting on himself and his friends who were also atheists, friends of his who are atheists. And he also says that he you know, is, has respect for atheists and he's not attacking them. He wants to challenge us believers and unbelievers, he calls atheists, to think about psychological reasons for unconscious reasons that predispose somebody to being an atheist. And this is his research question. His second reason for looking into why what might predispose people to predispose people to atheism is that he was doing biographical readings about atheists and he was inspired by Freud's idea that a young person stops believing in God when he has lost respect for his earthly father. And Witz is basically taking up this point from Freud and taking it forward by looking for autobiographies that fit his this particular dynamic. His hypothesis is called the defective father hypothesis. And what he wants to examine is does a de defective father impart a strong pressure toward atheism on the part of his children? And then he kind of expands on that point of children. He, he expands on it by narrowing the, the kinds of people he thinks are actually the targets of this. And he thinks that this is especially important for young, intelligent, intellect-oriented boys. And his a definition of a, de a defective father is any father who leaves the family, abuses the family, dies because a dead father equals a non-existent or abandoned, you know, the child feels abandoned or rejected. Um, but he also says that there are ways that a substitute father can step in. So it might be the case that a father leaves the family, but a, a substitute father in the form of an uncle steps in to especially, and again, he's going to focus on men uh, almost exclusively in this research. So that's his, his outline, his hypothesis. He, from this hypothesis, comes up with two predictions. One, if your father is defective, it is very hard to believe in God. And two, our perception of our father as being defective sets up a, spr a strong predisposition to becoming an atheist. So that's the ideas he had in his head. What he then does in order to find evidence is that he examines, this is all, by the way, this is from his own description of his methodology. I'm not interpreting here, I'm relating from his video. He examined biographies of famous atheists in history, and he's in particular interested in people who he calls strong or intense atheists. He doesn't particularly define this very well or specify what a strong or intense atheist is, but he contrasts this with a mild or a soft atheist. And again, not really defining what either of these categories means. He says he's not really interested in soft atheists. Okay. Um, and what, he's did in order, what he did in order to get evidence is he made up a list of famous atheists, and then he made up a corresponding list of famous theists at that time. 
So in his mind, the control group is the theists, and the experimental group is the atheists. This is me trying really hard to be professional. In his uh, speculation, he says that their lives are very different, so he wants to look at the childhood, and in particular the early life of these men that he selected in terms of his sample. And he picks out um, from these uh, famous atheists with defective fathers and famous theists with good fathers. These are who are going to make up his sample, sampling frame, as it were. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through his individuals because um, he basically, I don't think there's anybody except Madeleine Murray O'Hare who lived during the 20th century. His sample is basically white European Western men who are highly intellectual, highly educated. They're, they're people like um, Feuerbach, Schopenhauer, Freud. He's also got um, Hobbes in there, who technically wasn't a, an atheist, he was a materialist. He talks about Nietzsche and Madeline, uh, as I said, Madeline Murray O'Hare, the only contemporary atheist. And he just, the three of the four videos are basically him just going through these biographies and telling the sad tales of these poor, unfortunate men who ended up being atheists and their father issues. When it comes to an example, I'll just throw out uh, one illustrative example from his sort of two or three videos where he just goes through these individuals' biographies um, one story at a time. He's discussing Nietzsche in one of the videos and the fact that Nietzsche's father, I believe, died when he was a younger boy and that when Nietzsche grew up and became a man and his phrase, God is dead, to Witz, it's Nietzsche's not saying God is dead, Nietzsche's saying dad is dead. And yeah, I'm just going <laughs> to leave it at that. Um, this is his evidence. He basically goes through and finds a bunch of dead white guy European philosophers who were atheists. Um, sometimes they're not even atheists. As I said, Hobbes is one of his examples, um, materialist, but not an atheist for his time. He also mentions Voltaire, who I think um, is not technically was an, um, an out atheist. So he's got even a like, pretty expansive Anyone who's anti-clerical and questions God or you know doesn't toe the line seems to be um, eligible for his evidence or his um, his data collection, shall we say? In terms of the theists, he then just goes and lists a bunch of theists who had happy childhoods, and that's his evidence that def non-defective fathers lead you to um, stay a believer. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Now, he does admit that there are two atheists he found who did not fit into his prediction, and that is Karl Marx, who he could find no evidence, no matter how hard he tried, that he had a bad relationship with his father. And the same for Diderot. He looked, but he could not find any evidence of a neg negative relationship with his father before the age of 20, and at 20, Witt says this is too late for Freudian, you know, daddy issues to be the explanation. And that's how he treats his two counterfactuals. He just sort of sticks them in at the end after discussing the theists. And then he comes to another just sort of side note, which is half the population. Um, he talks about the difference between men and women when it comes to atheism. He says that um, most women, the women that he found when he did his research into atheism were not what he called true atheists. He doesn't say what a true atheist is. He doesn't say why these women or who they were um, were not true atheists, and I'm not entirely sure what's the difference between a true atheist and a strong and intense atheist and a mild atheist. So again, these are just words that he uses without clearly defining them in any meaningful way. And then, okay, be professional, be professional, be professional. He said that in his view, what happened in terms of what men did when they lost God and what women do, is that men replace, on average, of course, this isn't universal, he admits, but generally men have a belief system around God and so when they become atheists they replace that belief, belief system of God with another belief system. And I think he mentioned Darwinism. He might have said the theory of evolution. I don't want to you know, uh, put words in his mouth, but my note here says Darwinism, that uh, they will replace the system of God with the system of Darwin to find a satisfactory answer to things. And so men go intellectually, because I'm not going to comment till my bit, and that women replace a lost God with a relationship 
with a personal relationship in life. And he talked about uh, Simone de Beauvoir and her relationship with Jean-Paul Sartre. The, uh, the, um, uh, Madeleine Murray O'Hare and uh, Simone de Beauvoir are the only two women he mentions in four videos that I can remember. So that is his explanation. Um, oh, and also too, there's a critique of feminism in that when women become feminists, instead of worshiping the god, they worship the goddess. And that's how women who um, lose God replace it with just another interpersonal relationship. So he, that's his, his evidence. Okay, so um, this, because it's Halloween today, my slide here um, says nom nom nom, because now I get to do my bit. <laughs> and okay, um, Witz asserts that he has this hypothesis that if our perception of our father is defective, it sets up a strong predisposition for a person to become an atheist. And not just persons, particularly men, and not just particular men, but intelligent men um, who are going to become these strong atheists. And I have so many problems, so many problems with his approach and with his conclusions. And that's what I'm going to focus on in this video. I'm going to uh, destroy his research design, his sampling frame, and then I'm going to explain to you why I don't believe his conclusions and neither should you. Are you ready? This is going to be the fun part. Let's go. His research design. <sighs> Holy shit. Um, this is shocking. I mean, it is, it is shockingly bad. Um, I don't call this scholarship. I don't even really understand why you would have a book out based on this kind of nonsense. And it has nothing to do with the Freudian stuff. It has everything to do with his inability to understand what an experiment is, and to understand what a control group is, and to understand what um, an, an experimental group is. He just is, it's terrible. And let me explain, I'm, okay, I'm ranting now, but let me just explain to you why it's terrible. First, he doesn't even understand how to set up a research design. What he does is he selects atheists with bad fathers and considers theists with good fathers. And when he does come across atheists with good fathers, that's just an aberration. He just chucks those, you know, Marx and Diderot aside. He doesn't talk about Marx and Diderot in the body of his work with other atheists. He kind of goes through his whole theory and then puts good daddy atheists and women as sort of afterthoughts to his whole project. I mean, how insulting. Um, yeah, and so he also does not provide any criteria on what a good father is um, or, you know, I mean, a defective father, there are many, perhaps a range of these kinds of things in terms of, you know, over the course of a childhood or whatever else. He doesn't give a good definition of what a substitute father is. That seems to be just thrown in quite conveniently into a lot of theist stories without justification. Um, in, in terms of, like, just his conceptual framework, it is just there's no clarity there's no rigor there's there's nothing in there that is is actually substantive that says something to me when he does his explanation that I feel like I have understood the world better it just seems like he's rambling to be honest it just seems like he's sitting on his ass in an office somewhere thinking this shit up and somehow he puts it in a book and people pay for it and I don't understand why that is um, okay, I'm ranting again, moving on to the next point. Uh, what he should have done, right, if he's actually interested in this causal relationship between bad fathers and atheism and good fathers and theism, was he should have found famous bad fathers and he should have found famous good fathers. And then he should have looked to see whether or not the fathers of or the children of bad fathers were more likely to become atheists or whether the children of good fathers were more likely to become atheists. I mean, let me explain to you, if, for, if, if you don't do social research, let me try to explain what he's done in a, in a more intuitive way. Now, if I'm, as a political scientist, interested in, if I have an idea that older people are more likely to vote and younger people are less likely to vote, and then I go out and I collect, here's my data. I go, oh, I'm gonna go collect, I'm gonna talk to older voters and I'm gonna talk to younger non-voters. And then I'll put all that data into a, a, a data set and I'll run models and oh my gosh, older people vote and younger people don't. Well, no shit, Sherlock, because you're, you're actually sampling on the thing you want to find out, which is voting. If you're selecting people, if I'm selecting people because they vote or they don't and they fit a profile for being old or young, then I'm not really investigating voting. I'm just doing confirmation bias. And by going out and looking at atheists with bad dads and theists for, with good dads, he's basically predetermining his outcome. It's shit. It's just terrible. It's so bad. And I don't understand how 
he can get away with this. I don't understand why anyone would have ever signed off on this um, kind of research at all. And the other problem with his research design is that if he is interested in finding out why people are predisposed to atheism, why is he looking at a bunch of people who've been dead for 200 years? This is going to tell us nothing. He claims he was an atheist. He claims to have atheist friends. Talk to your friends. Talk to real people. Get up off your ass. Stop looking in books where all you have to do is pull something off a shelf. Go talk to a real person. Have to deal with their complex um, story and all the other factors. I mean, he's looking at bad daddies, but let's face it, there's, cl there's class in here he's ignoring in terms of privilege, there's uh, sex uh, differences that he's, you know, by um, picking out men and, and they're enjoying a, more access to education, these kinds of things, there's wealth. There are so many, there's so many potential other causal explanations. And he basically doesn't even seem to realize that the people he's picking are non-representative because they are all famous philosophers. This is like the least representative sample for a population in the in ever. You, if you wanted a, if you wanted to know the likelihood of you know athe, uh, famous philosophers having bad dads and being atheists, that's a great sample. Go collect all the biographies of dead philosophers that you want. But if you want to talk about life in the 21st century, then get off your ass and talk to some real people. That's what I am trying to do with my deconversion research, is to listen to people, to listen to real live people and their stories. Not to sit in an office, predetermine a conclusion because I happen to be reading a book, and then go look for a bunch of confirmatory evidence. It's bullshit. It's utter bullshit. And you really shouldn't believe anything this guy says in this, in this video. Okay, so the sampling frame. Yeah, the sampling frame has the same problems as I sort of mentioned in the research design. I kind of drifted from research design into sampling frame here. But really, he makes no effort to find non-white people. He makes little effort that I can see to find non-male people. He makes little effort that I can see to find non-Europeans, non-philosophers, non-intellectuals, non-elites. And I'm just wondering why he thinks it is the case that these dead men who lived lives that is completely different from the lives of anybody else today would have something to tell us about why people uh, who are atheists are atheists. And it's just, uh, it's really bizarre to me that he could treat half the population as an aberration, as if women are just an afterthought and not something to be taken up in, in a considered way. But then again, let's face it, his views are quite sexist and we see that he's sexist when he looks at men and makes assumptions about men and he's sexist about his assumptions about women. So I'm going to wrap this up. Let's see. Yep, this has been getting on a 25 minute rant, so that seems like enough. Why I don't believe him and neither should you. There's no compelling evidence. He does not present evidence, Dr. Paul Vitz does not present evidence in this video series that I'm going to link in the description box. He presents anecdotes. And in this case, a collection of anecdotes is not evidence. It's just a collection of anecdotes. Um, so no reason to believe him based on his evidence. He's, there's no reason to believe him based on the scientific method because he is not engaging in any kind of rigor. He is not making his test falsifiable. He's basically going out and looking for evidence that will confirm a predetermined conclusion. And that is never a good basis for any kind of conclusion. And that's another reason why I just don't believe him. His concept of the substitute father, and basically his terms in general are too vague, they're too inconsistent. Uh, if they're defined, you know, at all, I would I, I would love some clarification here, but he does seem to have a lot of terms, strong atheist, weak atheist, substitute father, um, all these kinds of things that he just chucks about and they always seem to, you know, happen to go along with his story, except when he, you know, has Diderot and Marx, which are the only counterfactuals he presents, and I find that highly suspicious. He is insulting to men and women. And I didn't expand on this too, yes I did, I did talk about the fact that he talks about the way that in, according to his speculation, men replace intellectual thought system with another intellectual thought system because men are robots who don't have emotions apparently and have to work things out in their brains, otherwise they, they, you know, they can't function. And women are completely opposite. Women don't have any brains, we just have all emotions. And so when we become atheists, um, we have to find a replacement 
I guess, father figure in this case, a replacement boyfriend or whatever, male figure to replace the, the, the figure of God. And again, there's, there's not like he has any evidence for this. This is just him pulling shit out of his ass, as far as I can, can, you know, can see. He doesn't cite any studies, he doesn't mention any people he's talked to. He's like, oh, well, you know, men are like this and women are like this. Bullshit they are. You're ignorant. I know that for sure based on your essentialist claims about what women are like and what men are like. And okay, he does, to be fair, he does say, oh, it's not always the case. But let's face it, but I'm going to just say, what he basically does is rely on sexual stereotypes to explain something rather than doing any work. And again, it's the whole sitting on your ass rather than getting out of your office problem that I generally have with Dr. Vitz's work here. And the uh, last thing I'm going to mention, I've touched on this before, but in terms of why I don't believe them is because he's, you know, where are all the non-European males in his study? Um, uh, it's just navel gazing. It, it just seems to be him surrounding himself with things he already feels comfortable with rather than pushing any boundaries. And I don't particularly find that a compelling reason to be convinced of his conclusions. Hey guys, that's going to wrap it up for An Atheist Asks. In my next episode, I'm planning on comparing biblical prophecies with scientific predictions to find out which ones are the most impressive. Probably don't have to think too hard to know which side I'm going to be on. But I'll see you next time, and thanks for watching.